We'll start with Melissa Craig, and she will give a presentation on EPS in sediment gravity flows. Melissa, the stage is yours. Thanks, Jaco. Um, so I'm Melissa, and I'm from the University of Adelaide in Australia. And today I'm going to present to you some of my PhD research, which has been looking at uh, what is the effect that EPS has when in a dynamic situation in a fine-grained sediment gravity flow. And my research has been a collaboration between the University of Adelaide, University of Bangor here in the UK, HR Wallingford, and the University of Auckland in New Zealand. So for those who aren't very familiar with the concept of sediment gravity flows, it's a flow that's generated by the density excess caused by suspended sediment particles in a contrast between that fluid and the ambient fluid. Flow behavior, so the, whether or not it's a turbidite, so the turbidity current, or a debris flow, very laminar flow style, that's a major control on the resultant deposit architecture that we see in outcrop, in core, or in the modern environment. And cohesive clay particles, which can bind together and flocculate, um, create a, can create aggregates and structures and gels that can dampen these turbulent forces and create that laminar flow behavior. And therefore, the amount of clay content or cohesive material that we have in a flow can change the deposit that we see. So, so far, all the studies conducted on sediment gravity flows have only looked at sediment as a modifying constituent. So clay particles, silt, gravel, sand, not yet has biology been considered as a modifying constituent. And I just want to bring your attention to the two images here, which, are, which were only released last week in the press from Niwa in New Zealand. And they are seafloor bathymetry images <coughs> of the Kaikoura um, Canyon offshore New Zealand before the November 2016 uh, earthquake and then after. And what the change that you see is the result of all the mud flowing off the continental shelf. And the Kaikoura Canyon is world famous for being one of the most biologically active areas in the world. So there's been a lot of talk about EPS and biofilms in um, this meeting so far. <laughs> but the key point relevant to my research is that EPS has been observed as binding to sediment grains um, and stabilizing beds and increasing erosion thresholds. So the question that I was presented with, or that I'm trying to answer, is how does, or well, can EPS affect the movement of particles in suspension? So before I go into um, my methodology and my results, I just want to explain a bit more about cohesive sediment gravity flows. When um, you're using non-cohesive material, your uh, flow behavior is turbulent, and flows accelerate the more denser your fluid is. So the more uh, uh, volumetric concentration of sediment you have, silica flour is non-cohesive. So the more you have, the faster the flow is, until you get to a threshold point, when the amount of sediment in the flow is just too much and it freezes. And so you get this deceleration here. But when you have cohesive material, like kaolinite clay and bentonite clay, that threshold value is achieved a lot earlier, and the maximum flow velocity and the runout distances of your flows is reduced the more cohesive material you have. So because EPS is considered a very sticky, cohesive material, I investigated what is the impact of, in, of um, EPS on fine-grained kaolinite flows. So to do this, I conducted a series of flume experiments. This is a photo of me conducting one here, where I released the fluid from a lock exchange here. And just the density difference, there's no slope to this tank, just the density difference drives the flow. And I filmed the head of the flow to calculate the velocities of the flow um, along the distance of the tank. So I used five different concentrations of kaolinite, ranging from 5 to 23%. And I use xanthan gum as my proxy for EPS. And I range that between 0 to 0.1% in all my experiments. So the data I'm going to present to you next, I'm going to show you 5, 15, and 22% kaolinite. And just to um, 
elaborate a bit more, the xanthan gun concentrations I used, um, or my EPS concentrations I used, are based on estuarine um, field data. So not exactly uh, deep marine values. And I had the scenario that for my given clay concentration, if that clay was in a bed of 40% porosity, using a background EPS value of 0.1%, and I also included a scenario where you have a biofilm with five, that consists of 5% EPS, I would then vary the concentrations of EPS between zero to this maximum biofilm concentration. So these are some plots of the head velocity of the flow, so the front of the flow, and how that changes along the distance of the flume. So in my low density cases, of 5% kaolinite, the amount of EPS that I added doesn't seem to have much of an effect between 0 to 0 0.02, oh, 0 0.223, that should be. And for the case of 15% kaolinite, for the background EPS, we maybe start to see some early deceleration, but that only becomes really obvious at these higher concentrations of EPS. And for the scenario where there's a biofilm entrained in the flow, this flow actually deposited within the confines of the tank. All the others bounced off the end. For high density kaolinite flows of 22%, that's where the effect that EPS has starts to get very evident. And for all the concentrations of EPS I added to the flow, the runout distance of the flow decreased within the flume. So my key observations from looking at these flume experiments and the velocity data is that very small amounts of EPS um, are able to reduce the runout distances of flows. At background EPS, this effect starts to become apparent between 10 to 15% kaolinite, and the effect of EPS gets stronger the more sediment you have in the flow. So just to emphasize this effect on the runout distance, these are the runout distances for 22% and 23% clay from the scenario where there's no EPS and then there's a biofilm. And it goes from four and a half meters to about one meter in distance. So EPS is promoting deposition of the clay particles in the flow. And the question I had was why? Is it affecting the settling velocities and the flop, part, flop particle sizes? So to investigate that idea, we conducted some labs flock sampling with Andrew Manning. And we took, uh, we used two flows, a pure clay scenario of 23% clay, and then a scenario where I added 0.0202% uh, xanthan gum. And to give you an idea, that's 17 kilograms of clay and nine grams of xanthan gum, dry weight. And I sampled, um, well, I sampled six different locations, but in, um, purposes of time, I'm going to be presenting to you samples from the end of the deposit and then a sample <coughs> that was extracted from the flow as it moved by at 80% of the runout distance, which is here for no EPS and then here for a case of with EPS. And this sample is extracted and then taken over to a settling column and the, uh, the flocks are filmed as they settle to determine the flock size and the settling velocity. This is, some of, um, the, this is some images of the footage itself. Uh, some of the like, observations I made straight away was that when there's no EPS, the flocks are very rounded. But when there is EPS, we get these, um, we have spider-like flocks and we see ones that have these comet-like tails. And they're much larger than the um, flocks that we see where there is no EPS. So this is a plot of um, settling velocity. Uh, log plot, and the flock size. And this is from the end of the deposit. And these three lines here represent density contours. So one of my first observations was that um, there's 10% more flocks greater than, uh, with a settling velocity greater than 10 millimeters per second when you have EPS in your flow. When there's no EPS, there's, um, Andrew counted about 10,000 flocks for each of these samples. So there's about 1,000 more flocks in the EPS case that settle at much higher velocities. And that's probably what's promoting this deposition. What I also noticed is that the EPS case, which is in dark green, um, 
is that there tends to be a wider distribution in the density of these flocks. So EPS is able to build flocks of lower density than in the case where there's no EPS in the flow. The sample taken from the flows itself um, at 80% of the runout distance, I didn't expect these to be too different because these, uh, these samples are taken from the same point in each flow's deceleration. So you'd expect that at 80% of their runout distance, they're most likely to go be resembling the same size particles. The maximum settling velocities of these particles are not too different. We do see some very large flocks um, when there's EPS, and there does seem to be more distribution in the density of the flocks um, with EPS. And I noticed that the flocks that contain only clay do tend to be a bit more biased towards the higher densities. So to conclude um, what I've obtained in my research so far is that very small amounts of EPS are able to slow down flows and reduce the runout distances um, greater than anticipated. And the effect of EPS becomes more significant um, with more sediment concentration. So the effect at small concentrations is small, but when you get to these high concentrations, the effect is more significant. And these two results are because of how EPS is promoting the flocculation of clays and building these flocks of lower density that can still resist the breakup by turbulent shear that you experience in a sediment gravity flow. In terms of what's next for my research, uh, looking at what the typical background values of EPS are in the deep marine environment is very important. Um, we do actually have some data uh, that was calculated very recently but I don't fully understand what the numbers mean, so that's going to be the next stage. It's also important to look at what's the capability of EPS when you have non-cohesive sediment particles, such as silt and sand grains. Is it still able to bind them together when you're in a flow? And what does that mean for deposit architecture? You're going to have, potentially, silt and sand bound together and deposited, so you might not get that same um, good like grading upwards or finding upwards result. And if there's one key takeaway I'd like you to have from my presentation, it's that sticky EPS um, is not just along for the ride and is a driver in sediment gravity flows. And it has the ability to change the flow behavior by building bigger flux and strengthening cohesion. And that our flow models in sedimentology do need to consider this effect. Thank you. I just wondered, um, in selecting Exampan as your model EPS, uh, what was the background for that? It's been used as a proxy for EPS in many previous experimental studies. I mean, it's the most extreme polymer you can get, isn't it? It is the most readily available uh, as well. it will change the settling velocity of clay particles without any flocculation of them. You could have been, because it's got such a massively high low shear viscosity, its viscosity changes by about a factor of a million between 10 to the So it is a, it's used as a suspending agent. If you, when you get on the airplane home, look at what's in the vinaigrette that makes your, uh, you put on the salad, it'll be oil, vinegar, and zampan gum. And the zampan suspends the oil from settling out of the vinegar because of the density gradient. So it's a suspending agent. So I just, I just, quick, a little bit cautious about zampan. It is very particular. Uh, it's the most extreme of polymers you can get. You might want to try and do it. There is a sort of counterexample that um, out on the Madeira Abyssal Plain, a thousand kilometres from source, there are five metre thick mud turbidites, which we argued a long time ago, were caused by the suppression of turbulence, but nevertheless the turbidite overrides a significant amount of water, and therefore it is lubricated at the bottom. And rather than having its um, flow arrested, in fact, this aims a very long run out, although it is effectively a non turbulent, cohesive turbidity current. Yep, so you're talking about hydroplaning? Yes. I think. Well, I think we did it before the term was invented. <laughs> <laughs>
such a lot of things in sediment gravity flows. Um, from what I understand of hydroplaning is that you need to achieve a certain yield strength in your flow, that it can like, sustain itself while having that water come underneath. Yep. So whether or not that, um, in the 23% clay flows, that was never achieved without EPS. And the more EPS I added, the, um, the flows became like a shorter run out distance. And I've, I don't feel like from all the footage that I've seen, they ever um, were strong enough to sustain hydroplaning. What you'd see in the footage is that it's almost like the front of the flow would break off. So it looks like it was trying, it was in that process, but it was not, did not have that strength. So. Yeah. Short one, perhaps? Yeah. Quick one. Thanks. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you.